Welcome to Living One. My name is Olivia Crossman. I'm your host. Living One is a monthly webinar series in which presenters from around the world share their vision for a future where all Earth beings live as one community in peace, dignity, and freedom. We ask the question, we know what's wrong, but what does right look like? This last fall marked the beginning of Living One's fourth year, but today these conversations are more important than ever, for they are more than conversations. They are opportunities to build community, solve for the isolating wounds of our time. Today, we have the third session of our spring series, Earth Restoration and the Evolution of Human Consciousness. This series will explore the widespread calls to restore nature who has suffered so egregiously over the past 500 years from colonizing human appropriation, deconstruction, and overpopulation. In light of recognition by many indigenous humans and Western science of animal and earth sentience, nature's restoration takes on a broader and a deeper meaning. Over the next four weeks, we will hear the perspectives of five individuals who have dedicated their lives to earth restoration and expanding human consciousness. We are delighted to have you join us as we explore this important topic together. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are all currently on various different indigenous lands. I am currently on the ancestral homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, which includes the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. This land exists also as a place of trade with other indigenous communities, including the Ho-Chunk, Miami, Menominee, Sauk, and Meskwaki. The Krulo Center for Nonviolence, located in Southern Oregon, is the homelands of the Grizzly Bear, Tacoma, Daku Benite, Coyote, Coho Salmon, Golden Eagle, and Gray Wolf. To recognize the land is to recognize the lasting effects of colonization, genocide, and oppression that still impact indigenous communities today, but it is also an expression of gratitude and appreciation for the land and for all those whose homelands we live and work on. In the third of this six-part series, we welcome Dr. Leslie Sponsel, a human, humanistic scientist. Leslie earned a BA in geology from Indiana University and an MA and PhD in anthropology from Cornell University. He is a professor emeritus in anthropology at the University of Hawaii. His teaching and research explore the interfaces among ecology, religion, and peace. In the 1970s, Sponsel conducted field trips to the Venezuelan Amazon to live and study with several different indigenous cultures, but mainly the Yanomami. Since the mid 1980s, during most summers, he pursues research in Thailand on Buddhist ecology and environmentalism, in recent years, focusing on sacred caves. Sponsel's numerous publications include these books, Spiritual Ecology, A Quiet Revolution, Religious Environmental Activism in Asia, Case Studies in Spiritual Ecology, Indigenous Peoples and the Future of Amazonia, An Ecological Anthropology of an Endangered World, Yanomami in the Amazon, Toward a More Ethical Anthropology Beyond Othering, Ethical Anthropology, Responsibilities, Reflections, res Resources, Anthropology of Peace and Nonviolence, and Non-Killing Anthropology, A New Approach to Studying Human Nature, War and Peace. Currently, he's researching and drafting the book, Natural Wisdom, Awakening Buddhist Ecology and Environmentalism. Sponsel is a guest living in the territory of the sovereign native Hawaiian kingdom of the Kanaka Maoli. Before we begin, let me share a few logistical notes. Leslie will be speaking for 45 minutes, after which we will have 15 minutes for question and answer. In order to proceed in a timely manner, we do ask that you please send your questions along in the chat during Leslie's presentation, and we will read them out after he is finished. For anyone who isn't familiar with the Zoom chat function, if you move your cursor towards the bottom of your screen, you will see a number of icons appear, one of which is the chat function towards the center left of your screen. If you click on that, the chat will appear where you can type any questions or comments as we go. We will we will have uh, two members of our Cruelist community here with us today, Jenny and Deeksha, who will be monitoring the chat throughout our time together. Also, please note that the Zoom session will be recorded, so if you would feel more comfortable leaving your camera off or changing your Zoom name, please feel free to do so. Finally, we ask that unless you're currently speaking, you keep your microphone muted to avoid any unintended, unintended interruptions. So without further ado, we welcome Leslie Sponsel. Uh, aloha from Hawaii. Hello. Uh, good morning. <laughs> uh, thank you for taking time. Uh, I hope I can say something that is of interest. Oh, absolutely. And thank you for taking time. We're so excited to chat with you. To start off, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit of your own arc, which brought you here to spiritual ecology? Well, it, uh, 
it's a long story, but I'll be short. Um, religion is really fascinating. And I've been exploring religions of the world uh, for quite some time, uh, academically and also personally, and ended up with Buddhism, uh, largely thanks to my wife, who's a Thai Buddhist from childhood. And um, I find the basic core principles of Buddhism to be uh, wisdom, common sense, uh, and worthy for uh, a lifestyle uh, as a guide uh, and helping to try to understand our, our world. Um, but in terms of spiritual ecology, I like probably many of you, I've had experiences in nature which are really extraordinary and might be considered spiritual. Um, a feeling of wonder, awe with the beauty of nature, of unity with nature, and more generally the cosmos. Um, this happened when I was hiking in the Rocky Mountains near Calgary, Alberta, Canada. During summers, I taught at the college, Mount Royal College there, and during weekends, I'd go to the mountains. Uh, and I was there early on in the spring. So I got to the mountains before the tourists and before the mosquitoes, and uh, it was wonderful. And also in the Amazon on a number of occasions, including with Yanomami, uh, an indigenous peoples in Venezuela and Brazil in the Amazon. And I really vividly recall uh, one morning in a canoe along a small stream with the forest on either side. And again, uh, not just extraordinary, not just exhilarating, but I think a spiritual experience. So in looking at spiritual ecology, in the background is also a personal uh, factor uh, that motivates me. But it's also just very fascinating and also hopeful. Um, and so uh, I became interested in nature, actually, from my parents, who were devoted to nature in many ways. And uh, I became formalized, professionalized in my uh, relation to nature when I studied geology and then biological anthropology, uh, initially at uh, Indiana University and then uh, later at Cornell University. And I was very lucky to get a job in uh, Hawaii at the university, um, extremely lucky. And um, I've been there since 1981. I was hired to develop and direct a program on ecological anthropology. And it was, a secular approach to the subject. Um, and in around 2000, I started getting interested in what I call spiritual ecology. Um, and when I worked with Yanomami for my dissertation, uh, I was studying hunting, the behavior and the ecology of their hunting. And I was looking at biological, cultural, and intellectual aspects of hunting. But I didn't think about spiritual aspects. And yet, <clears throat> when recently I read a book, uh, The Falling Sky, by a Yanomami, Davy Kopanawa, mm -hmm. and a anthropologist, Bruce Albert, The Falling Sky, Words of a Yanomami Shaman, um, I realized far more than ever that the forest for the Yanomami is permeated, filled with spiritual forces and beings. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an integral part of their worldview. And that impressed me more than ever. Then in the 1990s, I had the privilege of attending three of nine conferences at Harvard University on religions and ecology. 
each conference on a different religion in relation to ecology. I attended the ones on Buddhism and also on indigenous religions and then a more general one. And they were organized by Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm, uh, who are now at Yale University. And they have a wonderful website uh, the, for the forum, forum on religion and ecology, which has information on the different religions of the world and relation to ecology. It's, it's another treasure, just like your website um, at the Carolus uh, Center. Um, and I would encourage you to look at that website, Forum on Religion and Ecology. So that got me really interested in pursuing more and more spiritual ecology as a scientific and an academic pursuit. Um, and um, I, among, I teach courses like War and Peace and Ecological Anthropology, which can be sometimes depressing, mm -hmm. but spiritual ecology is really uplifting. It's so positive, it's so hopeful. And I hope you'll find it that way. Uh, obviously our world at all levels in all places is faced with serious environmental problems, issues, crises. It's an environmental crisis from the local to the global levels, it's a series of crises that are compounded, accumulating. And of course, climate change, global climate change, which I think you folks have experienced uh, in some ways and degrees in Oregon um, and elsewhere, um, that's an existential threat to our species and to the biosphere. Mm -hmm. um, and I really recommend uh, the climate book climate book by Greta, compiled by Greta Thunberg, the Swedish youth environmentalist climate activist. It has 100 experts contributing, over 100, and it's a wonderful compilation. It just came out recently. And also one other book, uh, Not Too Late, Changing the Climate Story from Despair to Possibility. Um, there's so much literature on climate change, but those are two things I would single out. Clearly, secular approaches alone are not enough. They're necessary, they're, they're crucial, they're vital, they're indispensable, but they're insufficient. My hope and that of others is that spiritual ecology uh, might help turn things around overall for the better, adding another ingredient. Um, and um, I'll say a little more about that. I, I define spiritual, spiritual ecology as a generic or umbrella term, uh, as a vast, diverse, complex, dynamic arena of interactions of religions and environments, spiritualities, environmentalisms, and ecologies. And these are all plural because they're very diverse, each of those domains. Um, others prefer terms like religious ecology or uh, green religion and so forth. Um, religious environmentalism, but I use spiritual ecology because it's more inclusive. Um, most people are religious and often that goes with being spiritual and even atheists can be spiritual, especially in nature. Um, so spiritual ecology has deep roots. Uh, going back to uh, the Buddha, to St. Francis of Assisi, you had an earlier talk on St. Francis, um, which was wonderful. And um, 
onward up to David, uh, Henry David Thoreau, John Muir, and many others, Rachel Carson, et cetera, et cetera. I discuss a number of those in my book, Spiritual Ecology, which is subtitled A Quiet Revolution. Um, as a scientific and academic pursuit, however, spiritual ecology is not ancient. It really began in the 1970s with the first Earth Day um, and uh, April 22nd, 1970. And the National, Organ the National Council of Churches was involved in that among other, among other religious organizations. Um, but spiritual ecology has matured. It's uh, grown exponentially uh, over the years. And uh, again, I refer you to the Forum on Religion and Ecology at, at Yale University now. Beyond the scientific and academic arenas, um, building on those, there are other developments elsewhere. An example is a collaboration between the United Nations Environmental Program and the Parliament of World Religions. In a book they published titled Faith for Earth, A Call for Action. Faith for Earth. That's available online free. You can download it, Faith for Earth. It's a wonderful book. Um, and that's just one example. Since the 1990s, spiritual ecology, I think, has been becoming a revolution. A revolution in this, in, in, it's quiet in the sense that it's nonviolent, it's diffuse. There is no single organization or leader, um, and it's nonviolent. Yet it has far reaching implications and ramifications. Many who are involved in that movement consider that the environmental crisis, including global climate change, is a moral and spiritual crisis fundamentally, ultimately, moral and spiritual crisis. And there are thousands of organizations involved. Uh, Paul Halkin, who incidentally is also a Buddhist, uh, in his book, Blessed Unrest, documents over a thousand NGOs, non-governmental organizations. Many of them, in one way or another, to some degree, are religious or spiritual, at least in motivation. Uh, many of them are part of this revolution of spiritual ecology. And I mentioned, incidentally, that uh, even atheists can be spiritual. And I wanted to mention a book by Donald Crosby and uh, Jerome Stone, The Rutledge Handbook of Religious Naturalism. I'm, I'm mentioning a number of books because they're the sources of my inf information and inspiration. And mm -hmm. some of you may want to uh, check out some of them. Uh, and I think they will be listed on, on the website here. Yes. Um, obviously, religion and spirituality can be important influences on individuals and collectively societies, for better, sometimes for worse. Um, and again, another book is by Gary Gardner, Inspiring Progress, Religious Contributions to Sustainable Development. It's interesting because it was published by the World Watch Institute, which is secular organization, environmental organization, but they got religion. They recognized religion is a tremendous resource for dealing with environmental problems. Um, and I'll give you one specific example, and that is Interfaith Power and Light, uh, an organization started by Episcopalian uh, minister Sally Bingham in uh, Oakland, California interfaith power and light and like all of these they have a website 
And that organization uh, started, I, I think it was around 1990 or so, and uh, it engages 22,000 religious organizations in the U.S. in more than 40 states. It involves more than six and a half million people in climate and environmental action and stewardship solar panels on religious buildings and recycling and so forth, which are secular things, but they are motivated by their religion as well. There is, however, a, a number of obstacles to spiritual ecology. And one of them is discrepancy between ideals and actions. Sometimes I think our species, instead of homo sapiens, the, the wise uh, humans, our, our title should be Homo Hippocriticus, the hypocritical uh, beings. We say one thing and do something else. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the obstacles. Then, uh, um, before one other question, uh, I think it's very important to point out that spiritual ecology is not championing, not advocating any particular religion. It's simply saying, if you're religious, then look into your faith, its sacred texts, its rituals, and so on, in terms of their environmental relevance, uh, and how that might guide your actions, uh, your lifestyle. Um, so it merely encourages people who are religious to pursue those things. Um, and the previously mentioned book, um, Faith for Earth, has chapters of a few pages each on different religions in relation to ecology and environmentalism. And Faith for Earth is available. You can download it online. You can search Google, which seems to have uh, <laughs> a lot of information, uh, although not always uh, helpful or, or positive or accurate. Um, and I'd also mention uh, the Green Bible for Christians that has over a thousand passages that are highlighted in light green that are environmentally relevant. Quite amazing. Um, so there are a lot of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a, an in incredible art and such a breadth of resources and I you were right that I will tell everyone now that these um Leslie sent me a, a nice list of the resources that he's been talking about and that he's going to mention in his um discussion today and we'll post those on our website with the YouTube so you guys can all go check them out after the fact but um thank you Leslie that was incredible and um so rich would you say um how would you say then that spiritual ecology as you've talked about it would relate or not relate to the Gaia hypothesis? Oh, yes. Um, James Lovelock uh, has written a number of books on Gaia, um, mm -hmm. the Gaia hypothesis, and you probably know about it, but uh, the Gaia hypothesis views the planet Earth as a giant organism, mm -hmm. a giant system with subsystems, components interacting synergetically, the interactions uh, influence one another and amplify one another. And they help maintain a dynamic equilibrium, a balance, and the conditions for life on the planet. It's an amazing hypothesis. And um, we are seeing now the disruption of that dynamic equilibrium with human environmental impact from industrialism, from materialism, from consumerism. Um, and incidentally, uh, when I was among the Yanomami, I never experienced any cultural shock. They were just people, very radically different society, but just humans fellow humans. 
But when I left the Amazon and went to Caracas and walked down the streets where there are the main businesses and looked in the windows with all of the objects, material objects, that's when I had culture shock. Mm -hmm. And I still do when I go into one of these massive stores, and I won't mention names, but you know them, mm -hmm. um, and people piling things in their shopping cart and so forth. It's become, they've become a temple of materialism and consumerism, which is one of the problems uh, that feed into environmental impact, negative impact. Mm -hmm. um, we are witnessing the inherent drive for this balance of nature, the establishment of some new equilibrium um, with extreme weather events. Mm -hmm. um, some of which you I hadn't heard before, atmospheric rivers, heat mm -hmm. domes, and so forth, in addition to other things which we've heard before, like wildfires, droughts, and floods, more and more and more of those, increasing in, in frequency, intensity, and scale. Um, very worrisome, the future. And we are impacting on the environment, of course, some societies far more than others, Yanomami are negligible in their environmental impact. Some um, individuals within societies far more than others. Uh, so there's a lot of di diversity there in environmental impact. But we are witnessing that in the evening news almost daily. The, the, the media is finally waking up in recent years to the reality of global climate change. The Gaia hypothesis emphasizes that the interconnectedness and interdependence of every being and everything. And you can see that. The wildfires, for example, currently in Alberta, Canada, the smoke is going to other parts of Canada and parts of the US. It's all interconnected and interdependent in many ways. You can think of many other examples. That's a basic principle of quantum physics, biological ecology, and incidentally also Buddhism. Everything is interconnected and interdependent, every being. And that's part of Gaia as well. Um, and one extraordinary thing is that astronauts, when they viewed Earth from outer space, have often had a spiritual experience. Mm. And generally, this is referred to as the overview effect. And there's actually an overview institute by Frank White, and also an overview institute, again, with a website about that overview effect. Mm -hmm. And they saw planet Earth as an island in the vastness of outer space mm -hmm. and how small and fragile it is. And as far as we know, the only place in the entire universe with life. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, what we're doing to that is just ecocide. It's insane. Uh, if there is intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, I don't think they're going to contact us. <laughs> they will stay away, <laughs> given what the mess we've created in many, many ways. Yeah. Um, Gaia has been interpreted from a religious, spiritual perspective as a goddess, uh, the very soul of the earth. Mother Earth as nurturer, as giver of life. And I'd refer to a book by Anne Primavesi, Sacred Gaia. I don't know that um, James Lovelock uh, necessarily saw this as religious or spiritual, but a lot of other people do. Um, and I think it may be time for another question. <laughs> Would you say then, so you've mentioned the, the, what we're facing right now with climate change and that 
secular ecology really doesn't cut it as far as a uh, response to that. How how would you say that spiritual ecology fills fills whatever gap is left by secular ecology, and how can we step into that role as spiritual ecologists in our own lives? I, I would say, uh, here's another book, I didn't mention it previously, but it's the idea of biodiversity. And um, I forget offhand who the, who the author is, but in the book, he, he uh, has the results of a survey of scientists. And he found that in terms of biodiversity, many of them are ultimately motivated by spirituality and nature, mm. but they don't admit it because they're scientists and they're objective and neutral and so on and so forth. But that's part of their ultimate motivation. Okay. Um, I think um, in terms of a spiritual ecological life, um, we could emulate uh, many different people like Henry David Thoreau at Walden, uh, his voluntary simplicity. Uh, we could meet our basic needs, but not try to satisfy all of our wants. Mm. That's a really important distinction, needs and wants. Um, we couldn't avoid getting on the treadmill of materialism and consumerism. Um, it's amazing, the Yanomami again, for example, they can put everything on their back and leave the village in about five minutes. Uh, their hammock, a machete, a bush knife, uh, men have a bow and arrow, women have baskets and some cooking utensils and a hammock and that, that's about it. In five minutes, they can leave the village and go out and camp in the forest for hunting and fishing overnight and so on, gathering plants. Uh, how many of you could put everything together that you own in five minutes and leave your house or your apartment? Mm -hmm. we, we are really on this treadmill and that's, that's part of the problem. Um, John Muir. Uh, unbelievable. And in California, you know, you can visit Muir Woods and you can visit, visit his home and so forth, and you can read his writings. He was the single most important individual in the development of the national park system. Mm. Um, others certainly were involved, but, but he was central, really pivotal. And that national park system has been emulated by many different countries in the world. Mm. Um, and there's a book by Carrie Mitchell titled Spirituality and the State, which is about national parks and the underlying religious motivation for many of the conservationists. Uh, so voluntary simplicity is one possibility. And I, I would mention Jim Merkel, his book, Radical Simplicity, and also his film, Radically Simple. Uh, an amazing person who has simply given up on the treadmill and uh, his book, Radical Simplicity, has a lot of guidelines and also some sections on religion. And also <clears throat> Llewellyn Vaughn Lee, Vaughn Lee, um, a, with Hilary Hart, a book titled Spiritual Ecology, <laughs> Ten Practices to reawaken the sacred in everyday life. Here at Ecology and Practices, one of those is simplicity, voluntary simplicity. And he also edited the wonderful book, Spiritual Ecology, The Cry of the Earth. Um, so I, I think uh, in terms of uh, lifestyle, uh, there are many things that can be done, and, and that book on practical practices for spiritual ecology has a lot of leads, uh, recycling and so forth and so on. But um, uh, voluntary simplicity is certainly one of the things. There's so much more to life than just the material, mm -hmm. which a lot of people realize 
unfortunately, when they are uh, uh, impacted by extreme weather events and they mm -hmm. lose their house, but they still have their family and they realize mm -hmm. uh, what's really important in life. Beautiful. That's beautiful. I think that's good. It's a words to take take with you and try to reframe as we're on the treadmill, so to speak. Um, would you say so? If you consider Earth as as a church in spiritual ecology, would you say that animals, non-human animals, and trees naturally embody spiritual ecology? Could you consider them like the the monks or the priests? Yes, I, that's a really interesting question, and I need to think about that a lot mm. more. <laughs> but um, um, nature is alive. Mm. It's sentient. It has feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, if you'll forgive me, I'll mention several books which illustrate that. Uh, Bernie Krause has gone all over the world recording the sounds of nature. Um, and his book is entitled The Great Animal Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And it's subtitled Finding the Origins of Music in the World's Wild Places. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a wonderful book. And again, he has a website, of course. Um, and Carlene Stang uh, published The Spiritual Nature of Animals. A country vet explores the wisdom, compassion, and soul of animals, veterinarian. Um, and if you've had dogs or cats, uh, I think you can sense the possibilities there. Um, uh, one book I didn't mention but comes to mind is Dharma Dogs, <laughs> about Buddhists who own dogs and their experience with dogs. And uh, spell the word dog backwards, and you get God. <laughs> There's a, and you can sense dogs are intelligent, sentient, feeling beings. They have empathy. The wonderful thing about dogs is they're not racist. Uh, they're not prejudiced. Uh, uh, it's amazing. Um, just wonderful animals. And of course, there's a long thousands of years of history between humans and dogs. Mm -hmm. Another book uh, I'd mention is by Suzanne Sinard, um, Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest. Her research demonstrates, she's a professor of forestry ecology at the University of British Columbia. And she has discovered a really quite remarkable communication between trees in forests through chemical signals that are sent through the root, rootlets, and fungi networks that are associated with trees. They can warn one another of uh, an invasion of insect pests, for example, mm -hmm. alarm one another. Um, you can begin to imagine what happens with clear-cut logging of a forest area. The trees must just be uh, alarmed isn't, isn't enough, strong enough word. They must be terrorized. Um, and you might think, for example, of the film Avatar, which you've probably all seen and is amazing. Um, and Avatar uh, really illustrates the um, mutual sentience and intelligence and communication between the Navi, which were looked like indigenous peoples in their forest, their relationships with the mother tree and other aspects of, of nature. In contrast, to the invaders, which are the industrial military complex that Dwight Eisenhower worried about. Um, and invading to get that precious metal unobtainium 
which which is an interesting uh, name for that. Yeah. And there is a book by Bron Taylor called Avatar and Nature Spirituality. With a, he edited the book with a number of contributors talking about the, the uh, nature spirituality in that film, Avatar. I wanted to mention a historian of world religions, Thomas Berry, B-E-R-R-Y, his book, Evening Thoughts, Reflecting the Earth as a Sacred Community, and a quote from page seven, uh, 17, quote, the universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects, a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. Uh, that's a very, very different perspective on nature. Instead of nature as a warehouse of resources and a sewer to dump waste, all for human ends, greed, not just need, uh, and so forth. But Thomas Berry, there's a website there as well. He was the teacher of John Grimm and Mary Evelyn Tucker and uh, um, has written a number of books. And the website has his lectures and other information about him and his ideas. He was a uh, Catholic priest as well as an academic scholar. And I, I would mention in terms of consciousness of nature, um, there are various degrees and, and, and ways of being conscious in nature. And for Buddhism, particularly Mahayana Buddhism, they have the idea of Buddha nature, that animals, plants, even rocks can have Buddha nature, which means the potential or awakening, or enlightenment. Um, and it's a very interesting concept, Buddha nature. Um, and I also mention, again, a, a Catholic priest and a scientist, geologist, philosopher, theologian, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who um, uh, and wrote a number of books. And he has a wonderful statement, quote, we are not human beings who have a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And of course, that could apply maybe to other beings as well as as humans mm -hmm. beautiful that's beautiful i know we have quite a few questions coming in in the chat and i want to make sure to leave time for those so is there before we shift there is there anything specific that you'd like to leave our audience with today but with the regarding the connection between earth restoration and human consciousness well your your uh website and programs are concerned with what is right Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I would say a couple of things. One is that nature is resilient. Uh, consider, for example, the DMZ, the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, a no man's land where nature has recovered. Wildlife is there, wild plants, etc. And there are peace parks like between Costa Rica and Nicaragua. Uh, which are, uh, in principle, no man's lands left to nature. And nature can recover. There are many examples of this. There is uh, Alan Wiseman's book, The World Without Us, based on science, uh, speculating on what would happen if all of a sudden all humans died. Um, how would nature recover? And also the History Channel had Life After People, a whole series on nature and how it would recover. And scientifically, there's research, Palmyra Island, etc. In many ways, nature is resilient. We have to just relieve the human impact on nature. And spiritual ecology in terms of what is right for life, 
uh, really encourages rethinking, refeeling, and revisioning our place in nature. And that's extremely important. Um, we, when I look at things that are hopeful, that are right, environmentalism, conservation, et cetera, um, my main question is, is it enough soon enough? <laughs> Is it enough soon enough? There's so much going on that's positive. The youth concerned with climate change, the movement one person, Greta Thunberg started among for climate activism by youth and there are others as well in many parts of the world. All of that is very positive, but is all of that cumulatively enough soon enough to turn things around for the better? What we are doing collectively as a species, and some far, far more guilty, others innocent, like Yanomami um, and other indigenous peoples who I think are the original spiritual ecologists. Um, what we are doing is going to, the cli global climate change is going to affect not just decades hence or centuries hence or millennia hence, but maybe millions of years into the future. And our, our government leaders, everybody, are not taking it seriously enough and seeing the urgency and that it's an existential threat. Again, there are positive things happening, the shift from uh, fossil fuels to renewable uh, resources like wind and solar and so forth. Uh, but is it enough soon enough? Um, so I think global climate change is not only an existential threat, but it's also an opportunity, again, to rethink, refuel, and revision our place in nature. And I think it's going to be a catalyst for spiritual ecology's quiet revolution. So I hope this is of some interest. I, I, I'm a professor and I mentioned a number of books here. Uh, maybe it's a little awkward for you, but there's no test. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Leslie. It's been, it's been incredible. I know I've learned so much and I can tell by the questions coming in that our audience has as well. So I'll read a few of those out. Um, Thank you. We started, we'll start with Mike. Um, He's wondering, would you consider mass extinction and climate change are totally interlinked and are critical in resolving the eco ecological situation we are in today? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And the group Extinction Rebellion, uh, mm -hmm. their concern with climate change as well in the United Kingdom. Um, and, you know, some of the environmental actions I understand, but... Uh, like going into art museums and throwing uh, paint on a, a piece of art, even if it's protected by a gl plastic or glass frame, uh, that, that's overboard. Um, but a lot has to happen uh, to wake people up uh, to this environmental crisis, mm -hmm. existential crisis. And species extinction is happening with global uh, climate change species, uh, they're changing their life cycles, they're changing their uh, distribution geographically and so forth. And, and of course, there are big problems like uh, with bees and uh, chemical pollution and bees are important and bats for pollination of plants, including uh, uh, crops that we depend on. So there are all kinds of interconnections here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Debbie is wondering how to conserve evolve that which is valuable in modernity and reincorporate the wisdom and lesser impact of indigenous peoples. She says, I am grateful that food distribution systems allow me to be vegan and not hunt. Uh -huh. Yes, I, I personally, my father was an avid hunter and fisher and I went with him a lot. And, uh, and again, I studied uh, Yanomami hunting. And if it's hunting and fishing for subsistence to get food 
to survive, that's one thing. But hunting and fishing for entertainment, even sports, I think is problematic. Mm -hmm. There have been researches even on fish and they feel, they react. You know, can you imagine a hook in your mouth and being yanked through the water? Uh, so um, I, I think being vegan is ideal, being vegetarian, even if you can't be 100% vegan or vegetarian, you can sort of go the middle way mm -hmm. and say two days a week or four days a week, I, I will not use uh, meat, uh, uh, have tofu instead, uh, or um, in other ways, moderate my diet. And, and it's particularly with uh, uh, beef, uh, which is the most expensive in terms of its ecological impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Mike is wondering, can we move to a steady state economy from a growth economic system? Well, again, rethink, refuel, revision. Uh, global climate change is a catalyst for many things. <clears throat> you know, the pandemic had a tremendous impact on, on almost everybody in some way and degree. And uh, I think global climate change likewise. Um, and we're going to be forced to change. We could change voluntarily, um, but if we are forced to change, it's going to cause a lot more suffering, a lot more hardship, a lot more expense. Um, and um, I think teachers and professors have, and parents and media and other agencies have a very important, vital, indispensable influence on creating uh, more awareness about global uh, climate change and species, mass species extinction and so forth. Um, we all have to wake up. Uh, at all levels of our society in, in many, many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And Kathleen is wondering, she says, a search for meaning or the missing feeling of meaning to life so many people and youth feel, even if unspoken, may be what connects people ultimately to nature and to the response to climate crisis and spiritual ecology paves the way. What do you think? Uh, well, again, if, forgive me, but I mentioned one other book, Joanna Macy um, and Chris Johnstone, their, their book, uh, Active Hope, Active Hope. And you can go to Joanna Macy, M-A-C-Y, her website, who incidentally is also a Buddhist. Um, and uh, Active Hope is a very positive book. She's had workshops all over the world. Um, and uh, helping people deal with their grief and anxiety and frustration over uh, problems like the environment and helping energize uh, people uh, and give them hope, active hope, uh, to deal with this. And she's had a profound influence um, and uh, unbelievable person. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, most important uh, in this world, uh, and she's really helped. I, I don't know whether I'm getting off on tangents and answering the question. No, that's perfect. And I think directing to resources to read more about this is, is perfect. Everyone can elaborate on everything that they're learning here. Um, Isabella is wondering, she says, I have been thinking about animal cultures as the way we see what matters to animals. That is the way animal populations express the meaning they find and seek in the world. I feel that, I feel that with what we do, we fracture their cultures causing breakdown. And I feel animals may struggle to find meaning too. What do you think? I think so again, uh... Nature is intelligent, has intelligence, has sentience. Um, and uh, I, I was walking, for example, our, um, our um, 
uh, daughter's dog in their neighborhood and another dog ran out and, and started to attack our dog. And I slipped and uh, uh, fell on my knee and I had a bit of an injury there. And when we got back home to our, our daughter's house, um, her dog was licking at the wound. Uh, and I, I think he was aware and empathetic, passionate. Um, I think he found meaning in that. And uh, so, yes, I, I think, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Beckhoff, mm -hmm. I forget his first name. Beckhoff has... Uh, is, is a cognitive ethologist, a student of animal behavior intelligence. Mark, Mark so Beckhoff. Mark, Mark, yes, thank you. And uh, he, um, again, has written a number of books about emotion in animals and so forth. And I think he could answer that question uh, far better than I. But uh, I think there is meaning and purpose uh, in, among beings in nature beyond humans in various ways and degrees. But isn't that the fundamental um, foundation in, at least in aspects of Zen Buddhism, that, that everything is sentient, everything is awakening yes, and, yes. and awakened and, and the, those that are not awakened or have gone back to sleep <laughs> or unconscious um are sort of writ large this segment of humanity which has been evolving. So, you know, we, we say even a rock, but a rock is sentient. Um, you know, and again, from a quantum physics perspective, the most the most parsimonious, like an Occam razor's approach, <laughs> the most parsimonious explanation or description is that every every being, every element is sentient and awake. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And to me, from yeah. my mind, that the 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 indication when something is not awake is they do things like we're doing. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, especially Mahayana Buddhism, the Eastern Asian Buddhism, uh, but also it it uh, it uh, links with it interacts in synergy with uh, in East Asia, for example, Japan with Shintoism which is a kind of spiritual ecology. And I forgot to mention um, forest bathing. Um, and there is a book on that. It'll be on the list there, uh, forest bathing. A um, uh, What is his name now? Um, Yoshifumi Miyazaki, a book, Shinrin Yoku the Japanese art of forest bathing. As a scientist, he made controlled experiments with teams of researchers on people in forests, uh, measuring their uh, pulse and various other uh, physiological reactions to being in forests and uh, their blood pressure lowers and so forth and so on. So this interaction with trees and forests uh, it's an amazing book, uh, very well illustrated and, and a quick read, amazing research. And it's one example. There's a whole field called eco-psychology uh, and a book by Craig Chel Chelquist, uh, Terra Psychology. Uh, and and eco-psychology basically argues that a lot of physical and mental problems result from our alienation from nature, particularly urban societies. Um, and with the internet and people uh, addicted to cell phones and iPads and so on and so forth, television, um, watching nature uh, movies on PBS instead of going out into nature in addition. Uh, and so forth. And uh, so the eco-psychologists are arguing that you, if you reconnect with nature, that can be healing physically and mentally. And uh, neighborhoods that have more trees are healthier in many ways. There's a lot of scientific research on all of this. Yeah, absolutely. 
Does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to ask or comments they'd like to share before we wrap up here? Yes, can you tell us about your, your new book that you're writing or that's coming out? Uh, hopefully within a few years, it's called uh, uh, Natural Wisdom, Awakening Buddhist Ecology and Environmentalism. Uh, and there's a vast literature on that and other books, including by Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, David Loy, uh, Stephanie Kaza, K-A-Z-A, and others. Um, and uh, it's a fascinating uh, subject, uh, Buddhist ecology and environmentalism. Um, and I have various obligations, including I'm still teaching one course a semester, and um, uh, so on. So it's, I'm not devoting full time to it. It may take a few years. That's exciting. Thank you. I'm well, looking forward to it. Whenever it comes out, we'll have yeah, to. So, oh so am I. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, if we've if no one else has any other questions, uh, we can wrap up here. Leslie, this has been incredible. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with us. This is just, really just one just one question. What sure. are you all, what are you all going to do with spiritual ecology? You can answer <laughs> that on your own. A good good to think about. Absolutely. And if anyone would like to share, please feel free. But um, Oh, also, also, uh, you're, anybody's welcome to uh, send me an email if they want to make comments or have information or questions. It's Absolutely. just sponsor at hawaii.edu. Sponsor at hawaii.edu. Thank I you. Into the chat for everybody. Hawaii.edu. And we also, um, like I said in the beginning, Leslie's shared generously shared a lot of additional resources for everyone to utilize and we'll make sure to make that accessible to everyone and we'll share his email as well so you can you can get in touch um next week we do have our next um guest on living one will be joined by alice venesia the founder and director of the pian piccolo selvatico foundation a rural research center working at the boundary between art deep ecology and interspecies coexistence and she will be joining us Friday, May 19th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. As always, if you enjoy Living One and feel called to support Carulos and all of our sanctuary residents, please consider donating at the link on our website, carulos.org. Once again, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Leslie, so much thank uh, for you. being here today. We really appreciate your, your time and all your wisdom that you shared. Aloha. Thank you, everybody. Aloha. Aloha.